So today we are in Ephesians. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians uh, for the better chunk of, of this calendar year. We started out in late January, took a little bit of a break uh, around Easter, and we have, uh, we've got about another month, uh, I think five more weeks to go. But we're in the book of Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 11 through 21. And a lot of what's in uh, verses 11 through 21 is very similar to what we've been dealing with over the last several weeks. Uh, and rather than spending 35 minutes plowing through this stuff one more time, we're going to look at it. We're going to, uh, going to look at what these verses specifically have to say to us this morning uh, because they, they are in God's Word. God put all of this stuff in there uh, for a reason. Um, but because some of it is, is very similar to the things that we have have. Uh, have, have talked about um, over the past few weeks. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes kind of reading through uh, chapter 5 and, and looking back and, uh, and, and looking at, uh, at these things that God has given us to do. But I want to spend kind of the bulk of our time focusing on this beautiful little poem that the Apostle Paul puts here in verse 14 uh, where he says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I want to look at that. Uh, in the light of all the things that God commands us to do in, in these verses and in the verses that we've looked at uh, over the previous several weeks. So uh, let's go ahead and, and open up Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. And like I said, the last two weeks we've, we've talked about a lot of this stuff. And, and if you missed any of the last two weeks, you can check out uh, the messages online or just look through in your, in your personal study time this week or in your personal devotional time. Just kind of read through Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5. And, and look at it, look at God's, this is, this is God's description of what a godly lo life looks like, you know. I mean, on, on some level it is commands, it is stuff that God has given us to do, but ultimately this is the description of what our lives should begin to be looking like as we follow Christ together. So uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And is verse 21 on there? Oh, oh and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I don't know why I didn't put verse 21 in my notes, but that would have been helpful. But uh, Father, we just uh, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that it's true. We thank you for the things that it says about you, how we can know you. We thank you for the things that it, that it tells about us about what you have done for us, how you have given up your son so that we might be saved. And we thank you for the things that it tells us that we ought to be doing, for the, that you took the time to, to, to write down your word and your truth to show us how, how we ought to be living our lives. Lord, help us, um, to, uh, help us to live our lives in a way that pleases you. Not that we might gain salvation in doing that because we know that salvation is by grace through faith. Scripture tells us that over and over again. But help us to live our lives in a way that pleases you as a response to what you have done for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Help us as we, uh, as we study this, this, this passage together this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So it starts off, it says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Um, I've always had a little bit of trouble with that, that little phrase there, instead expose them. You know, the way we, we think of that phrase, you know, go ahead and expose the unfruitful works of darkness. It almost to me, it sounds a little bit like tattletaling, you know. And, you know, go after them, bring them out, you know, go after people. Um, and we don't want to, you know, I don't believe that God wants us to be, that Jesus didn't do that. 
Jesus didn't, you know, hold up signs and throw rocks at people that he didn't like how they, how they behaved. But, but I think, you know, as, as I was studying this, this out and I look at this word here, I think it might be better translated as refute them. You know what refute means? To, to refute the, work of dark, the works of darkness. And the best way to do that is to live our lives the way that God has called us to live our lives. We don't need to make a big speech. We don't need to hold up a protest sign. We just show people what it looks like to live according to God's ways. We show people what God's wisdom and what his truth looks like. The wisdom in God's way of living. And I believe as we do that, that that, that begins to help people understand the difference between the ways of, of darkness and the ways of light. You know, we, we, we teach them, we lead them into God's grace. We don't beat them over the head with condemnation. We lead people into God's grace, <clears throat> you know. Um, as we go on to verse 14, uh, we're going to skip, like I said, we're going to skip over verse 14 for right now. We're going to look at that <clears throat> in just a few minutes. I just kind of want to get at what this passage is telling us. Um, I don't want to necessarily, I don't want to skip over anything because God put it in there for a reason. Um, but uh, as we look on in verse uh, 16, no, verse 15, it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. You know? Look carefully how you walk. Make the best use of the time. Am I wasting my life on excuses? Some of us, some of us do that. We waste our lives with excuses. Or am I really committing myself to learning to imitate God like, like we talked about last week in verse 1? Am I making excuses or am I learning to imitate God? And that's what wisdom is, is really all about. You know, if you look on in verse 17, <coughs> that's what wisdom is, is really all about. It says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the opposite in that verse of foolishness? Not necessarily wisdom, it's understanding what the will of the Lord is because that's how we find wisdom. When we, when we understand what God's will is, when we understand what God's truth is, that is wisdom. The opposite of foolishness in verse 17 is knowing God's will. Which brings us to the question, how do we know God's will? How can we know God's will? And we could spend a lot of time on this and we'll probably do this, um, we'll take a whole Sunday and really look at how can we know God's will for our lives. But I, but I just, for right now, in the context of these verses here, I just want you to know that God's will can be known. I mean, it's not as mysterious as some people uh, might think it is. Um, and I think ultimately you just have to know, that you have to ask the right questions, right? So a, lot of us, a lot of us, when it comes to God's will, we're thinking about things like, who am I going to marry? What job am I going to have? Where am I going to end up living? Those kinds of things. And in reality, I think God's will is more about the kind of person that we're supposed to become, the, the kind of things that we've been dealing with over the last week. You know, God, how does God want me to live? That's what it means to know God's will. It, mean, it doesn't mean that you know the future path that you're going to take. I'm not saying that God might not show you those things from time to time, but it means knowing God's will is, is about knowing what is, what is God's will for living my life in the spot that I am in in, in life right now. That's what God's will is, is mostly about. How does God want me to live? What kind of husband does God want me to be? What kind of wife, what kind of father, neighbor, friend does God want me to be? It's not so much about where I'm going to end up living, but how I'm going to live when I get there. It's not so much where I show up to work in the morning, but what kind of person am I going to be when I show up? And if we step out in that, if we learn to begin to reflect the character that God wants to develop in us, and if we learn to begin to, to be the person that God is, is making us into, if we'll commit to learning to do life God's way, we'll begin to find that God's going to work his will out in those other details of our lives. So therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. You know, I mean, I think this, this still has to do with more of the wisdom versus foolishness thing. Be careful. Think about the things that you're doing. Think about the things that, that, that are in your life. Don't get addicted. There's a lot of stuff that you can get addicted to. Not just, not just, uh, not just, uh, um, alcohol, you know, don't th let things lead you into sin. Uh, that's what it's saying here. You know, be careful, live as wise. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it says, and I know some people disagree with me, I don't think it says do not ever 
drink any alcohol, I think it says do not get drunk. Don't be, don't be foolish about it. Be wise about it. Make good decisions. Don't let things lead you into sin. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think this is kind of the climax of where he's going in this passage. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to camp out on this for a few minutes. And then we actually have a special treat this morning. Uh, Rhonda McCall, many of you know Rhonda. She's going to come up and share a little bit of her testimony with us this morning. Um, and I think that's going to be powerful. So uh, that's something to look forward to. That's something to pray for her if you would because she's going to be coming up in just a few minutes. Um, but before she does, I want to I really look at this be filled with the Spirit because I think this is where Paul is leading us. The Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians is leading us in all of this. Now, now we have to understand what he's saying here. Now all of us, we've said this several times. We've read this in Ephesians. All of us who believe have the Holy Spirit indwelling our lives, living in our lives. We all have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. We've seen that several times in this book. We have the Spirit, we have access to the power, but we're not necessarily filled with it. We're not necessarily filled with the power of God, right? That's evident in, in our lives. We look at the lives of the first century believers in the book of Acts, and there's a, there's a power that's missing in many of our lives that they had that we don't have. And it's not that we don't have the same. We have the same spirit in our lives. We have the same power at work in our lives that rose Jesus from the dead. But are we, are we filled with it? And I think if we're going to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, we have to be willing to be emptied of everything else. And I have to confess, that statement I didn't quite really get out of the scripture here. That's kind of a simple mathematical statement, right? There's only room for 100% in our lives, right? And so if we are 99% filled with my stuff, my thoughts, my ideas, my ways, my desires, then I'm only 1% filled with the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. I have access to that power. I can claim that power anytime that I'm willing to empty me of myself. But it's not really oozing out of my pores the way it seemed to, to be in the lives of the apostles. Right? Either you're filled with the Spirit or you're filled with yourself. Does that make sense? Because God's not going to compete for our attention with a thousand different things. God's not going to take second place or third place. We've got to be willing to give ourselves completely up to Him. We've got to be willing to put everything on the table. There's nothing I won't do. There's nothing I'm not willing to change. There's no place I'm not willing to look inside and, and, and adjust so that it lines up with your word. There's no place that I'm not willing to follow. And the more that we empty ourselves of ourselves, the more we empty ourselves of our strength and our thoughts and our ideas and our plans and our ways, the more God is going to fill us up with Him. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's about submitting to God's work in our lives. About laying ourselves down and emptying ourselves so that He can fill us up. <clears throat> that's what it's about. This is not, that's the key to this whole stuff, that, the, all the stuff that we've been going over to. It's not it, it, over. It's not, not so much a list of rules that we have to follow. I mean, it is. You know, they are important. God has put these things in there for a reason. And he wants our lives to look like his word says that, that it should look like. I mean, but ultimately, it's, about, it's not about checking off a list of boxes. It's about being filled with the Spirit, emptying us, ourselves of us, so that God can fill us up with him. You know, it's good to have passages like this, right? It's a measuring stick for ourselves. We can, we can look inside and see how God is working in us. We can look at these lists and see how we're doing. Okay, my life's doing better here. But you know, I, I need to pray that God... God helps me out in this area because I'm not doing as well uh, with, with this stuff yet. You know, or in some cases, my life looks nothing like what Scripture says it ought to look like. And God can use that to break us. God can use it to bring us back to Him or maybe even to bring us to Him for the first time. And ultimately, that's what I want to see in here. I want this stuff not to, not to fill our heads as we walk out of here this, this morning, not to fill our heads with a bunch of, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, 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 and this, this. I can't even keep it all straight, much less do it. I want us to walk out of here saying, okay, yeah, this, this is driving me to know that I need more of Jesus in my life and to seek Him. That's, that's the point of all this. <clears throat> and as we do that, I, I do want to back up and look at verse 14 before... Uh, Rhonda comes up and shares. And this is kind of, I think, what she's going to be sharing a little bit about. Um, 
But it says, verse 14, it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I think this is where it really hits home for a lot of us. Wake up, O sleeper. It doesn't say this, but today, I, I see urgency in those words. Wake up, O sleeper. He's not saying like whenever you feel like it next month, school, whatever, you know. Wake up, O sleeper. Today, not tomorrow, there's, there's urgency in these words. See, this morning, I'm not really talking about heaven and hell so much as, you know, we talk about that a lot. You know, talk about people that are, you know, I'm talking to people that are going to heaven. You are saved, you're going to heaven, but, but, but we're like asleep a little bit. You know, we know Jesus, but we're just kind of, we've just kind of been lulled to sleep by the way that the world is, by the cultural Christianity around, is a, the way cultural Christianity is around us, and we're just kind of asleep a little bit. You know, we're, you're saved, you're going to heaven, but some of us in this, in this, in this room this morning, we are, we are one no away from wasting our lives that God has given us. We are one no away from waking up one morning at, at 80 years old and saying, I didn't, did I really do anything with my life? Did it really matter that I was even here? We're not going to go to hell. We know Jesus. But we're wasting our lives, some of us are. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Not tomorrow, not next week. Today, let the light of Christ shine on you. Today, let God fill you with His Spirit. Today, empty yourself. Today, it's too important to put off. Look back at verse, verse 16. It says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. There's an urgency to this because honestly, God knows that most of us aren't that disciplined. How many times have you put off doing something until later only to discover down the road <clears throat> that you actually never did it? Right? Our, our walls and our house are taped up to be painted. We taped them up in January. <laughs> we will paint them one day. I said that back in January too. That's just a wall. That's not that important. But this stuff is too important to put. We're talking about wasting our lives here. We're talking about wasting the life that God has given us. That's too important to put off until tomorrow. And today is the day that we need to make a conscious decision to empty ourselves, to put everything back on the table. Today I'm letting God fill me. Today is the day that I start getting intentional with my life, that I really start seeking after God, that I really start learning to live His way. Today is the day to learn to walk in holiness. Today is the day to live a life marked by love and truth. Today is the day to love my wife the way that she needs me to, to lead my children, to pray for them, to sacrifice for them. Today is the day and step out and do those things that I know that God has been calling me to do for years because if I put it off till tomorrow it's not coming tomorrow is not coming and I'm going to wake up one day and realize that I've wasted my life because really tomorrow is just an excuse I think the smashing pumpkin said that they got a lot of stuff wrong but they got that one right tomorrow is an excuse a lot of us we, we use tomorrow as an excuse tomorrow I'll do better tomorrow I'll pray Tomorrow, I'll, I'll dig into the Word. Honestly, you, you probably won't. It's an excuse. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you can't imagine how you're going to make it through. Maybe, maybe you can't imagine how you're going to deal with this stuff that you're, that's weighing down on you. Don't say, one day I'll get it together. One day I'll get over this. One day I'll, I'll pull myself up and I'll make it work. Tomorrow, I'll be fine. Because tomorrow's not coming. Seek God today. Get, if you need help, get help today. If you need a Christian brother or sister to come alongside you, seek that out today. Seek his peace today. Seek his joy. His joy. Be filled with the Spirit. You don't have to let, get your life cleaned up first. <clears throat> you don't have to figure it all out. Just lay yourself down right where you're at and ask God to fill you because tomorrow you'll find another excuse. Satan is always going to make sure there's another tomorrow to distract you. I want to share this clip really quick and then Rhonda, if you'll come up at the end of the clip and, and share with us. Um, but it's from the movie uh, Divergent. Uh, the girl in the movie has just kind of joined a new faction in this society. 
Um, and this is the first test of the new group that she's joined. She has to jump, and you'll see in a second where, where the jump she's got to make. She's got to jump or she's out, and if she's out, she's homeless for the rest of her life. And uh, so she's got to make this choice now. She can't put it off. She's got to jump now. And some of us are in this boat spiritually. We've got to jump into something that God's been calling us to jump into, and we've got to do it. I'm going to introduce Rhonda. Most of you know Rhonda McCall. She spent... 27, 28 years in Ukraine as a missionary? 20, 21. 21, okay. Oh, that's right, and then five or six in South Africa, right? Okay. But uh, Rhonda is going to share with us this morning. And so. I wasn't sure I was the right messenger for this, but um, I want to... Uh, it was interesting this morning, Bo said to me, Rhonda, did you listen to that song yet? And I said, I haven't listened to it yet. And I said, I forgot what it's called. And he said, it's his story. He said, when we're Christians, our story is his story. And uh, it's true that you and I were all on a journey with the Lord. And um, we all have a story. And our story is his story. If we know Jesus, then then we're on a journey and whatever is going on in, our, on in our lives, he wants to make part of his story for his glory. Um, maybe you have been like me. You've asked questions in your life like um, you've wondered, am I ever going to have victory in this area of my life? Am I ever going to be free from this in my life? Or wondered, what is... If I really gave my life like 100% to the Lord, what would happen? Uh, would uh, he make a mess of my life? <laughs> would he take away something or would he force something up on me if that was my attitude towards him? And um, so that's part of my story. Uh, a little bit of background is that I was born in Asheville in North Carolina. And uh, when I was six years old, we moved to Oregon. And I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Um, when I was 16, we moved back to North Carolina. So I went uh, to school with all the same friends for, all, for, for many years. And then I moved back to my, sophomore, my junior year to North Carolina. And I went to high school in Asheville. And I graduated from Drexel. So I had a few shocks coming back uh, from Oregon, ch changes in life. And so I was here in North Carolina, and um, I decided, I went to one uh, year of college here, and I thought, I'm never going to get to pay for my university. I'm going back out where all my friends are, where I can work a job, where I can earn enough money to go to university. And so I packed up my 64 Ford Galaxy and drove across the country uh, back out to Oregon, 3,000 miles. And uh, waiting for me out there were wonderful friends. There were about eight of us girls, and we had been friends since we were 13 years old. And I was thrilled to get back out there. And one of my closest friends was Kathy, and we were roommates. And when I had left, you know, all of our lives were pretty much the same. Some of us were Christians, a couple were not. But we all lived a similar moral life as far as our values. Um, and I got back out to Oregon. And uh, as often happens in university, uh, you, you begin to investigate other things. But I had come to Christ when I, was a, when I was nine years old. And it was a solid come to Christ. I grew up in good churches. So I had good input in my life. I had good people in my life. I saw good examples in my life. And almost all my mom's family are believers, and most of my dad's family were believers. So I grew up in that kind of environment. But um, I began to see that my friends started going to parties. I started going to parties. My friends started drinking. I started drinking. And... Um, there was something going on in my soul, but for a couple of years, I felt like I began drifting from the Lord. And I would go to church now and again. It made me feel better. Uh, I remember I would go work until 10 o'clock at night. I'd go to campus, do my studies. I'd have an evening job. I would come home at 10, take a shower, go to a party, get home in the late, late at night, and open my Bible just to read a few verses before I went to sleep. Um, 
But it didn't give me any power to live the life that I thought God wanted me to live. Uh, I would go to, um, my friend and I would go to the Mount Hood, le over 11,000 feet, and we would go skiing. And I would stand up on that mountain and say, Kathy, I mean, her, she grew up in a home where her dad was an atheist. And so she considered herself an atheist. But I wanted her to come to Christ so badly. And I would say, Kathy, how can you look at God's creation and not believe that there's a God? And she just said, I just don't believe. And we would go to the Oregon coast, which is magnificent, huge boulders, and the waves come crashing across those boulders. And I would say, Kathy, how can you look at this and not believe in God? And every time we would have this discussion, we would end up in a circle, just circular discussion. Um, and so inside my heart, I felt like God really wanted to do something, but I had this fear a misconception about God. And it was, if I really say, God, just change my life, do whatever you want with me, he was going to take away my friends and he was going to ask me to do something that I didn't think I wanted to do. We have great imaginations in that area. And, um, but there were three things that happened to me after my uh, sophomore year of, uh, of university. First thing was, my brother and I, my brother lived in Oregon too, all the rest of the family and relatives but were back here. And he had married a girl who was in a, uh, in a cult. But for a couple years, I mean, they just lived their lives. But after that couple years, about the time I was at my end of my sophomore year, my brother joined that cult. And all of a sudden I thought, I've got to help my brother. But I had no power to help him. I had no life to show him because I was not living fully for the Lord. I, you know, he didn't think I was living a bad life, but I just had no power in my heart. I tried to talk to him, but there was no power in my testimony to talk to him. The second thing that happened um, was my friend Kathy and I were talking again about the Lord. And I said, and I was saying, Kathy... This is the most important decision you can make to know Christ. She said, um, I don't see any difference in my life and people that call themselves Christians. And I thought, I'm that Christian. She really doesn't know a lot of Christians. She spends all of her time with me and she doesn't see any difference in her life and my life. The third thing that happened was one of those Sundays that I decided to slip off to church in the morning. I was sitting in the back, and uh, the pastor got up, and, and at, he introduced these two guys and said, these guys are, are young Christians, and they're getting ready to go to this big conference down in Ta Dallas, Texas, and they're coming up, and they're going to share their testimonies with you. These two guys got up, and I almost fell off my seat because I knew them. It was Jim Kirby and John Kohlenberger. And Jim and John were really well known. First of all, they were all American gymnasts. And so, and they were very, they, you know, they were all American gymnasts. But they also were known because they were hoods. You know, they drank and they did drugs and they, you know, I'm, when I talk about the lifestyle they led, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to contradict what uh, Jason said about drinking. But what I'm saying is they led a lifestyle of, of being involved in drugs, and it's a wonder that they were athletes, but they were. They were very good athletes. And they got up, and each one of them shared their testimony about how God had transformed their lives, and that they were now living for him. And they were, I looked at those guys, and I thought, those are two completely guys. So those three things caused me to stop and say, God, what about me? If you can transform their lives, Maybe you can transform my life. But I still wrestled with that, the fear that I had. And it was about that time that I was coming back here for three weeks of vacation in North Carolina. Um, and so I was driving back with my friend Sandy. I dropped her off in Tennessee. Not much happened along the way. I just was behind the wheel 18 hours a day and we got here. And I spent three weeks here. And in that three weeks, 
I used to go back up, and my mom's youngest sister, who was a good friend, was only six years older than me, uh, back up in the Nantahalia River Gorge. It's a beautiful place where my grandparents had li lived, my mom had grown up. I went up there several times because I just loved being with them, and I would go camping with them. We went camping about three times. And I would sit around the campfire with them and about three other couples who were their closest friends, all of them Christians. And they would sit there at night and talk about Jesus. And they would sit there at night and sing songs to the guitar. And they would, uh, and I could see Jesus was just at the center of their lives. He wasn't just a part of their lives, way out there somewhere. And that really began to grip me and convict me of, wow, Christ is at the center of their lives. That is a life I would like to have. And the very last Sunday that I was here, I left home early in the morning, and I went up there. I went up there Saturday night, and I spent the night, and I went to church with them that Sunday morning. And those four couples after church, one of their brothers was there, and they went outside, and I was getting ready to leave. I wasn't even going to. I was just going to leave from there. And they started talking to him about the Lord and sharing their desire for him to know the Jesus that, that they knew. And that struck my heart so deeply. I thought, man, if they knew how I'm living my life, they would probably be talking to me. And so I said goodbye to them and went, you know, I, I cried from there to Tennessee when I picked up my friend and I couldn't cry anymore. I had to put on a happy face. But in my heart, even though Sandy and I were having conversation along the way, my constant conversation was with God all the way across country. And um, the conversation was, God, I can't do this. I don't even know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to change my life. And I wrestled all the way. I don't know how to, I don't want to lose my friends. I don't know how to change my life. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I was, as I was traveling and getting closer and closer to Oregon, I thought if I cross that Oregon border between Idaho and Oregon and do not say, God, yes, you can do whatever you want to do in my life, I won't do it. It'll be too late. And so there was this wrestling match going on. And uh, finally, I got, it was right before the border. And my heart to be, to have what I saw my aunt and my friends have, to be free, w overcame the fears. And I just said, God, you can, I want you to in control of my life. And it was as if I just threw my hands up in the air. I had, my, had them on the steering wheel, but it was as if I th threw my hands up in the air. I said, God, you, you do whatever you want to do with me. I want you to be in control of my life. I want you to be my Lord and master in every area of my life. And I, you can do whatever you want, and even if it means taking my friends away. And so um, I can, you know... It's a long story to explain all that happened. God began to work miracles in my life. He began to do things in me and for me that I could not have done for myself. Um, and I saw him bring a transformation in my heart that I, that I could not have uh, actually expected ever. Um, there's, there are several verses and several words that kind of describe what happened. Did I lose my friends? Uh, what happened was, you know, I began to read my Bible regularly. I had a love. I, just, I really wanted to know what God had to say for, to me. Nothing drastic changed. I be, had less desire to do some of the things they, that I had been doing, and so I wasn't doing them. Um, I began to go to church faithfully. And sure enough, my dear friend Kathy, we'd been friends since 13 years old, she said, started telling some of our friends, Rhonda's become a religious fanatic. And so I lived with that for a while, but I, I God gave me strength to love her. We lived together in an apartment and to just be free. I mean, I was happy and I was free. And what happened was individually over the next few months, every one of my friends came to me and said, Rhonda, what's going on in your life? There's something I like in your life. There's something powerful going on in your life. Would you tell me about it? 
And I had another opportunity to share with Kathy. She didn't come to the Lord right away, but she was so much more open to, to talking at that time. She has, you know, she's come to definitely to believe in God. I don't know if she's come to the Lord. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, that talks about three kinds of people. It talks about the natural man, the one who doesn't know God. It talks about the spiritual man, the one who knows God and walks with him. It talks about the natural man, the one who doesn't know God. And it talks about the carnal or fleshy person who knows God but really isn't living in his power, isn't having that 100% filling of the Holy Spirit that Jason talked about. Um... One of the verses that helped me the most in this time was Romans 8, 31 and 32. And it says, what shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also freely with him give us all things? That said to me, if God loved me enough to die for me, to send his son to die for me, doesn't he love me enough to give me the very best right here and now? And that's what I began to discover. It wasn't that he, did, he was, didn't want to give me the best. It's just that I was not allowing him to give me the best. And um, Galatians 2.20 uh, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And so I think of these words, I think of 1 Corinthians 3, it's like I was moving in one direction and we think of repentance as for unbelievers, but repentance is for believers as well. And it's, and it's an ongoing process in our life. And I literally turned around before that border and said, Lord, I'm ready to go in a new direction with you. And um, Galatians tells me it's impossible to live that life. The only one that can live it is Christ in me and through me. Uh, I could not have lived it and I did not have to muster up the strength to live it. It's a supernatural life that only he can live. And the third thing uh, is that Romans 8, that if he loved me enough to die for me, he loves me enough to give me the very best. And he's the only one who knows why he created me. If I don't let him show me that, I won't even know why I am created or, or what I am to live for. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about surrender. Um, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And it goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your spirit that you may know what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And... Uh, I only learned how good and acceptable and perfect his will for me was as I was willing for him to be in control of my life. Now, one of the things I thought was, you know, somebody could think, well, yeah, you are a single missionary. That is the last thing in the world I want to be. But I can tell you that God is so creative that his per plan for you is so perfect and so beautiful uh, it's probably not for you to go to Africa or the Soviet Union and Ukraine as I did. But it op surrender opens up that opportunity for him to reveal his perfect will for you. Um, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 6 in the next few weeks. It's about spiritual warfare. And that's part of what the Christian life is. Satan always wants to put us in bondage. God always wants to deliver us. Satan always wants to trip us up. God always wants to set us free. And so part of that is learning, growing in our faith, but it has to do with those principles of uh, surrender and trust in him and knowing who he is. Um, it continues to be a journey. And so it's not like you make that turn and then you never have any struggles again, right? <laughs> But, that, but once you know that your life is in his hands, you want him to be the one to be Lord of your life, then we experience, as you know, many of you, that 
He's there for us when we go through the struggles. He's there for us when we fail. And it's just a matter of maintaining our fellowship with him. Uh, so it's critical that we need to let go and give over. It's, it's progressive in that then we continue to walk with him by faith. Uh, we don't have to make those kind of turns all through our lives. Once we turn, uh, then we can continue in faith. So... One of the best places to um, live that out and have support and encourage and prayer is in a small group. We don't get to do that a whole lot here in the big church setting. So if you aren't in a small group, Jason didn't tell me to say this, I really encourage you to find a place in a small group or come to the women's group or the men's group. You know, Wednesday night, Stephanie led us through First John, the whole book. But she was picking out passages on love, and it was really powerful. And in that small group, we were able to share more of our personal lives and our needs and pray for each other. So um, this, is, this has been a great adventure for me. Uh, but wrestling and struggling with the Lord is not a fun place to be. The most miserable person is not a non-Christian. The most miserable person is a Christian who is in the wrong place are not really experiencing the fullness of the Spirit in their lives. Thank you. You know, a couple of things struck me. Is one is that you know I know Rhonda as this lady that has given her life up to to uh, to be a missionary into the mission field. Um, she's given her life up to, to singleness because that's been God's plan for her as a as a missionary and as a as a believer and, and she has walked as far as I can see walks with the Lord exemplifies the kind of character and holiness that he wants to develop in us and one of the things that was encouraging to me is she was once a college student kind of floating around like I was once a college student kind of floating around and uh, God did something in her heart and something in her mind and she took that she, there came a point in her life where she just said, that's it, I'm, I'm done, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm emptying myself of myself and I'm letting him fill himself up with me, with him. And uh, I think the second thing that struck me, and you, you kind of pointed to this at the end of your testimony, was, was uh, how that, that was, uh, we, we make a lot sometimes of those, those moments of decision, those emotional moments. Maybe a service like this or something like that. And uh, that wasn't the end. You know, you didn't get to the Oregon border and say, okay, I, I give up. And then you're like, and everything's been great since, you know. Um, that over time, God worked and God moved. And, and one of the things I was going to ask you is, is uh, that the many, uh, probably most of us in this room are not going to be called to be missionaries and to go overseas and, and to do some of the things that you've done. Um, you know, but what kinds of things do you think that maybe God might be calling us to do? And, uh, and I think you answered that just by, by, by you started. That's probably the other thing that struck me is you just started to, to do what you knew God wanted you to do, to share. You didn't wait until the moment that you became a missionary. You didn't wait until the moment that you became a pastor or whatever. You, 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 you right in that, in that moment, in that, uh, um, you started living the life that God called you to live. And I think that's powerful. Some of us are waiting for that day that we arrive when the heavens open up and the glory of the Lord shines down. If you're waiting for that day, it's not coming. I've heard people say, I'm waiting for the burning bush. I'm just waiting for God to give me a burning bush. Well, you know, he did that once. <laughs> 3,400 years ago. Good luck. <laughs> if you guys would, uh, would come forward, I just want to encourage you this morning. It's kind of like what we've talked about. Today is the day. Uh, tomorrow is an excuse. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And I think today is the day to get those things right with the Lord. And today is the day to start doing it. Um, don't, the, the work that God wants to do in your life might not be able to happen during a three and a half minute song. <laughs> uh, but it can start. Uh, you can come. The altar is going to be open. Communion is going to be available. You can sit right where you're at. Find somebody to talk to. Make that commitment in your life now. Uh, but if God's calling you to make a commitment now, <clears throat> it's something that's going to day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. Uh, 
um, that's going to be impacting uh, the way that we live and the things that we do. And so I just want to encourage you today. Today is the day.